uh, naval chiefs, distinguished guests, uh, fellow sailors, uh, I am honoured to be here today for Irons number four and for what really is a classic example and manifestation of, of naval diplomacy. Um, I must confess though that I am somewhat of an Irons groupie. Um, I was posted, I had the great privilege of being posted to India as a defence advisor um, in 2007 and I spent three years there and during uh, those early phases I, I was in a, in a very, very small way um, involved with the Indian uh, Navy and the Chief of Navy, uh, crafting, uh, executing um, and then delivering the inaugural lines at the Taj Man Singh Hotel in, in February uh, 2008 of that year. Um, and ever since then I've kept a very close weather eye on how the organisation has been tracking. And as I was researching this presentation, uh, I dug through the archives to see if I could find a photo um, and I found one which I was there for, uh, one of my favourite ones. And in this one here you see uh, the, Indi the Australian Chief of Navy at the time, uh, Admiral Rush Shoulders, being introduced to the Indian Prime Minister, Manmohan Singh, with Admiral Mehta on the far left and, and Minister Anthony in the background. And so I wish to commend the Indian Navy for their vision and leadership in 2008 and also to all the navies since then that have constructively participated in the forum. And I have been very enthused by the headway we have made um, and I do hope in the coming years that our speed of advance uh, will increase. Now I, I need to put a caveat on my narrative and notwithstanding the fact that I'm in a white suit here, um, the, the comments which I'm about to deliver are, are my comments. Um, they haven't been endorsed by the Navy or the Chief of Navy um, and so I would just like to make that point clear. So my presentation is in two parts, in essence a why and a how phase. Uh, initially I'll tease out some of the maritime security issues facing the region but as we've seen the last day and a half we've had many experts um, from Australia and around the world really drill down into these issues and I'm not going to really be able to value add um, too much more on that. But then drawing upon this data, I'll then discuss how we must, may best meet these challenges via naval cooperation. Uh, and listening to my colleague Jane's uh, wonderful words, um, without preempting my, my own thoughts, I, I do note that we've drawn very similar conclusions to the, about the region. Now, it is an axiom of the great oceans in the world, uh, the Indian Ocean does stand apart. Um, a quick glance at any atlas will reveal that although smaller to its two bigger cousins in the Atlantic and the Pacific, the IO is geographically, politically, religiously and culturally exceptional. And I pause on that word exceptional and I did deliberate for some time whether I throw the phrase in Indian Ocean exceptionalism and whether there is a case to be made right now in 2014 for IO exceptionalism. Uh, I won't dwell on that point um, but I'll just leave that with you. But clearly that was not always the case. And to illustrate this point, I take you back to the 1st of April 1977, um, April Fool's Day, when the UK Guardian magazine ran a seven-page feature on the remote island nation of San Serif, complete with its two major islands, semicolon in shape of uppercase and lowercase. Um, of course, it was all a great joke, a very elaborate joke, um, but huge numbers of people uh, fell for it, uh, with the Guardian switchboard flooded with phone calls from people wanting to know more about these fictitious islands and where they could book a holiday. Now, um, I'm not passing any judgement on the British people or the Guardian magazine because I'm sure if you had around a similar feature in the Australian dailies around about that time, you would have seen an identical response. But truth be told, the Indian Ocean just did not feature in the minds of the general public. And the fact that so many people at the time had so little knowledge of this ocean is clear evidence. Now fast forward 37 years and how things have changed. Uh, some for the good, um, some maybe uh, for the bad. So what are these maritime security issues? And I'll do a whirlwind tour but I've, as I've already mentioned, um, the presenters before me have already spoken at length about these. Um, so it'll really just set the scene for the second part of my presentation. But what we do know is that uh, in recent years, lawless, lawlessness around some of the areas in the Indian Ocean has seen a proliferation both vertically and horizontally in transnational crime, and we've seen a consequent downswing in local stability and security. Um, 
up until three years ago, piracy was rife around and near the Gulf of Aden. Um, of late, however, those alarm bells which rang so loudly for so many years have been successfully silenced or at least reduced to a tinkle. And this really is a vivid illustration of what naval cooperation can achieve when the situation appears so hopeless. Now, a combination of embarked armed security teams, the implementation of best management practices by the shipping community, and the prosecution of pirate action groups has manifested in the lower level levels of piracy for years. And if you were to do a scoreboard, it would now read, Navy's one, bad guys zero. And I'm unaware of any other point in time, I stand corrected, that all five permanent members of the UN Security Council have worked together militarily in the same space for a common cause. And really, that is the beauty of navies. But that said, as good seamen, we need to maintain a proper and effective lookout on this matter and watch for telltale sign, signs of resurgence in piracy. Receiving far less media coverage, and for that matter, international attention, has been the trade of narcotics through the region and the movement of militants by international terror organisations across the I.O. In recent months, though, a number of very large interceptions have been made in the Indian Ocean with Combined Task Force 150, proudly, I say, led by an Australian team at this moment, having interdicted three tonnes of heroin and 12 tonnes of hashish with an estimated street value of $3 billion. Even more pressing has been the vocal intent of some well-known terror groups such as Al-Shabaab, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula and the Abdullah Abzan Brigade to attack merchant shipping in and around the Straits of Hormuz and the Balbandid motorway. Now, whilst terrorism, piracy and narcotics sit at one end of the naval spectrum, just as important and as alluded to previously as is the protection of fish stocks, which acts as a life force for many countries in the region. In recent years, we have also seen a large increase in people smuggling, often with very tragic results. And rarely does a year go by when we are not faced with a natural disaster of biblical proportions. Last year, and specific to the Indian Ocean, we witnessed the tragedy of large-scale flooding in South Asia. We also saw, later that year, uh, cyclones in the Philippines. Now, stepping aside the argument around the arguments to why these disasters are occurring more frequently and with more brutality, the simple fact remains that our region, our towns, our villages and our people are becoming more exposed to nature's anger and the rallying cry for subsequent assistance is being repeated more and more. Of course, there are a host of other issues which trouble us, rising sea levels, pollution, energy reserves, threats by non-state actors, navigation and the exploitation of maritime resources. As I speak, Australian military units, P3C Orion aircraft and the warship HMA success are deployed in the southern latitudes of the Indian Ocean, searching with other countries for Malaysian Air MH370. Stepping aside these problems, what none of us can dispute, is that the ocean is the economic prosperity that drives us. And the math is fairly simple. All of our countries are almost totally reliant on the ocean as a sea bridge for trade. Trade is the elixir which powers our economies. Now, without seeming to be too cute, I would like to borrow an expression from ex-US President Bill Clinton, who during his 1992 election campaign ran a slogan along the following line, it's economic stupid. And if for no other reason, naval cooperation is vital in order to ensure the free flow of trade. This then leads me into the second part of my narrative, really the how, establishing a framework for effective naval cooperation. Now, we all know that the oceans are anarchical, and I say this in a very political scientist uh, um, uh, terminology in that there is no overarching governance in the region. This makes policing and enforcement all the more difficult. In the last couple of years, there's been an expression which has come into vogue talking about the maritime commons, which denotes this type of anarchy. Sociologists, though, for about the last 40 years, have pointed out that when a resource is held jointly, it is in the individual's interest to exploit rather than protect the asset. And the expression, the tragedy of the commons, 
was even coined to describe this way of thinking. Again, this is why collaborative efforts through navies is important for the region. So how best then do we translate this into some form of coherent policy for irons? Well, at first glance, the ROVSI is a temptation to mirror the conceptual framework of the Western Pacific Naval Symposium and use this as a, naval, as a template for naval cooperation in irons. And there may be merit in replicating some of what WPNS, in, WPNS entails, but the history and ideology of that construct is very much different to irons. It is informally to note that WPNS has been in existence for 26 years and has 21 participating navies, whilst on the flip sides, Irons history is only six years old and 35 member navies. So I would argue therefore that naval cooperation within Irons needs to be slightly more nuanced. And certainly one of the factors that has contributed to a lack of progress in such fora as IRR has been the size and diversity of the region. And in order to gain any real traction in the sphere of naval cooperation, I consider there is merit in adopting a sub-regional approach. So I'd like to expand on this concept. Now maritime security, just like other forms of security, is more often than not directly influenced by distance. Now to turn a very popular Australian expression on its head, it's the tyranny of presence. And political purists use the terminology security complex to describe how countries which are clustered together tend to have interwoven security linkages. What affects one? affects others, and in fact this goes to the point that Dr Gosch was making yesterday about the relevance and the perception of security between countries. Now by looking at the conundrum of regional maritime security through a reductionist lens, and by binding iron states into smaller, more manageable and homogenous components, ones that are generally reflective of the security complex I identify with, may offer a pathway for successful naval cooperation. Now fortunately, the original architects of Irons nicely divided the grouping into four geographic sub-regions. These being the South Asian littorals, the West Asian littorals, the East African littorals, and the Southeast Asian and Australian littorals. And you'll see there that that's what's denoted in those circles, generally reflective of security complexes that they operate within. I offer that naval cooperation, be it navies, coast guards and police forces, should in the first instance be very loosely based on these above mentioned sub-regions, as they offer a host of advantages. Firstly, the sub-regions bring neighbours together. Second, the cost of any interaction is reduced. Third, as noted, the sub-regions tend to share similar security challenges. And finally, there already exists a level of cooperation between navies within these subgroupings, and thus states could leave each off existing cooperative frameworks. But I add a caveat here. Nothing should prevent a navy from working with another sub-regional grouping or multiple sub-regions. Indeed, this should be encouraged, in particular for those navies that have such capacity. Now, drawing upon this framework, the sub-regions of Irons could pursue a naval cooperation agenda based on the following objectives. Maritime domain awareness, capacity building, interoperability, and then the final one, distinct to every sub-region, really maritime areas of common interest. Now, that may be a bit too small to, to see, um, but essentially naval cooperation within Irons Group needs to proceed at a pace which is both pragmatic and sustainable. Now whether we call this a campaign plan or a passage plan, it matters not. But I would offer that any plan for naval cooperation within the region needs to have a number of waypoints for which we aim for. And you'll observe in this slide that there are activities in the embryonic years are squarely focused on local cooperation and outcomes. And once such cooperation matures locally, then we can expand that out for more advanced collaboration. And we really must inject some serious ballast into these naval relationships before we transition from soft power to hard power cooperation. In the future, downstream, we could consider bringing naval units together to exhibit their wares during a nines conclave, thus turning the conclave into more than a meeting of mines, but maybe rather a maritime gathering for training activities. 
Now, the success of Islands will rest to some degree on the sense of ownership by its member states and perhaps one simple mechanism which may induce an element of collegiate consciousness is an Irons ensign. And just as all naval, coast guard and maritime police forces fly an ensign at sea, navies of the IO could similarly fly in addition to national banners and Irons ensign. One that would not seek to supplant national ideals but rather serve to foster a spirit of brotherhood amongst Irons mariners. In the final analysis, what Irons should be looking for is the development of a naval community. Firstly, within each subgrouping, and then finally as a whole. A naval community that has a shared identity and where a high degree of functional cooperation and integration exists. But it is clear that the roadmap to establish a naval community will be different for each navy and each subgrouping. And I would like to conclude by making the point that naval cooperation is not just about military units working and exercising together. Now, this aspect is important, but is not the core reason why states contribute forces to work as one. Naval cooperation is, in essence, about promoting collective self-interest over the individual interests of member countries. Thank you.